Coming up, a new documentary tackles freedom of the press and ICT has a new political reporter. Plus, we continue our At the Crossroads series about a proposed lithium mine in Nevada. I'm Mark Trahan. Join us for those interviews plus headlines from the ICT newscast. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. This is the ICT Newscast with Alia Chavez. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Trahan. Alia Chavez is away. We begin in Colorado with a celebration of 50 years of legal work by the Native American Rights Fund. Around 300 people attended the gala Saturday night in Aurora. The crowd gave founder and executive director, John Echohawk, a standing ovation. The Native American Rights Fund actually turned 50 in 2020, but the pandemic delayed the event. The Denver Indian Singers honored all NARF staff, current and former, with a song. Echo Hawk told the crowd, the first case they took on was on behalf of the Menominee Nation, which was terminated by Congress in 1954. And in 1973, we were successful. Congress admitted that they made a mistake in terminating the tribe. They thought it was going to be good for the tribe, and it was disastrous. He said NARF grew an Indian legal revolution that changed everything for Indian people. Dolores Pigsley, chairman of the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians, recalled a time when her tribe had just $12 in the bank. Now, she said, thanks to NARF, they have a land base and a booming economy. Echo Hawk says NARF is ready for the next 50 years. In New Mexico, the Federal Bureau of Investigation is using the Diné language to help close unsolved cases. For Navajo Nation families with missing or murdered loved ones, the hope is that new leads could help bring about closure. Currently, this effort, a department first, will focus on homicide cases. The FBI's Albuquerque office recently released a poster in Navajo asking for information on the death of 75-year-old Wilson Joe Chiquito. He was from Counselor, New Mexico, and died due to blunt force trauma to the head. There's a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person responsible for Chiquito's death. A spokesman for the FBI says it will communicate any way they can to make it easier for people to contact them. The department has a Navajo translator in its Salt Lake City office, and audio versions of other posters are now in the works. Staying with news in the Southwest, nearly 100 years ago, Albert Barnes traveled from Pennsylvania to New Mexico, where we had met Navajo and Pueblo families. He was immediately impressed with the cultures and started collecting art. Yet the Barnes Foundation is best known for its collection of paintings from European greats such as Cezanne, Matisse, Picasso, and Van Gogh. And now, for the first time, his collection of native art is being featured in the exhibit Water, Wind, Breath, Southwest Native Art in Community. Patty Talahangava shows us the exhibit. That was one thing that something that's very interesting about the Barnes collection is that he didn't um, only collect the um, clean pieces, the aesthetic pieces that he did he would collect pieces that showed um, uh, what, you know, what we call indigenous wear. Tony Chavaria is the co-curator of the exhibit Water, Wind, Breath, Southwest Native Art in Community. He says Albert Barnes purchased pottery that had been used because it showed how art was a part of everyday life for Pueblos. In 1931, he attended a deer dance in San Ildefonso, Pueblo. Lucy Fowler Williams says it moved him greatly. He wrote to his friend, the painter Henri Matisse at the time, and told him how beautiful the ceremony was. And he um, wished that Matisse had been there to see the color and the form and the seriousness of the dancers and the community all coming together. Barnes collected 239 pieces of art in what's known as salvage anthropology. Well, we have to collect these things because the people are rapidly disappearing. 
you know, these, these, uh, these data people are rapidly disappearing. So we've got to collect all this material. Um, but, you know, that we're still here. And that's why the exhibit also includes contemporary Native art. I wanted viewers to come away with was knowing for sure that um, there are many Native communities and artists who are just making incredible work today. The exhibit runs through May 15th in Philadelphia. Patty Tolohungva, ICT News. Basketball Native style. That was the sound on Sunday as the NBA's Phoenix Suns aired the game in Navajo. Last week, the organization announced it will partner with Native Broadcast Enterprise. The game was heard on popular radio stations like KTNN. L.A. Williams served as the host. She is a popular voice, having started her radio career in 1992. She previously provided play-by-play -play coverage for other NBA Finals games, the NFL's Arizona Cardinals and the Oakland Raiders. Williams will continue to call the games as long as the Suns are in the NBA playoffs. And that team started off with a win. And those are the headlines for the IC2 newscast. Coming up, tribal leaders in Nevada say lithium mining is the new development. We learn more. But first, we're introducing you to the newest member of the ICT team, Polly Denetclaw. We'll be right back. As most viewers and readers know, ICT has been growing like crazy, and that includes hiring new staff. We recently brought aboard a new political correspondent, and she'll be based out of Washington, D.C. Polly Denetclaw is a Navajo citizen with lots of experience covering Indian country. She has worked for a staff reporter for the Navajo Times and the Texas Observer as an Indigenous Affairs reporter. She has also served on the Native American Journalist Board. She joins us now. Polly, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, this is not your first trip to, uh, to ICT, uh, and your first trip involved Washington, D.C., so maybe tell us about that. Yeah, so I first came to ICT through the uh, Tribal Media Fellowship, and I was super excited to go to Washington, D.C. It has always been a dream of mine to report from the Hill, so being able to do that fellowship was an incredible experience, and it really is the reason why I wanted to apply for this position. I got a taste for reporting on the Hill and it was just a tremendous experience. And so I'm really excited that I get to continue that reporting. As you know, I love politics and this year is going to be an extraordinary year. And so much of what you'll, you'll be doing is trying to translate stuff that kind of gets in the weeds for some of us, but for readers and viewers, it's really important to explain what's going on. H how do you want to go about this? Yeah, so I feel like I, over the last year, have had a lot of experience in really explaining uh, the nitty gritty of policy um, that really impacts folks. And so I'm super excited to be able to utilize those skills um, coming here to ICT to be able to translate some of the nitty gritty languages, language that is in these acts. So I'm super excited to do that. Uh, a lot of my work previously um, before joining ICT uh, was really embedded in like historical context. Um, and so I feel like not only do you need to understand policy, but you also need to understand the historical context of everything in order to really grasp why uh, these laws are so important and how they impact Indian country. Well, in fact, that context is, you're absolutely right because you look at right now the uh, whole fight over voting rights and that's really not a new conversation to tribal citizens. It's not, it's not a new conversation to tribal citizens. We've been having these conversations uh, for a long time and in particular, uh, in my community here on the Navajo Nation, we have had serious cases of gerrymandering, um, of really trying to break apart the native vote. And we saw it again this season in the redistricting of New Mexico. Um, and there are again claims of trying to break up the native vote. One of the things that's interesting to me is that in some parts of the country, 
native people undervote. They don't turn out in, in enough numbers to make a difference. But in other places, and I think this is a story not told, is the overvote when people turn out in higher percentages. And New Mexico is one of those places. It is. And one of the unique things about New Mexico is that the native vote is so important in this state and we sway entire elections. And you can also see this in Arizona as well um, with those key uh, Navajo votes. Um, when those come in, it changes the entire environment of voting and it makes it very exciting because you really don't know until the native votes are counted. Last cycle, there were more native candidates running than ever before in history. What does it look like so far for this election? You know, it looks to me, it looks like it's going to be another historic year of folks running. I have seen so many people um, declaring declaring their run for office, and I'm so excited. It just gets me super, um, I am super thrilled to be able to follow Native folks as they run for local, state, and national seats. And it's something that I'm really excited about this election cycle. And you, I have been following a few of the folks who have declared, and it's really exciting. I know it's early, but uh, so far, what's on the horizon in terms of candidates that interest you? Yeah, so really the candidates that interest me, um, I might be a little bit biased, but here in my own small town of Gallup, New Mexico, there are so many Navajo folks who are running for office here. I see a ton of like signs up and I'm super excited to follow um, the county elections here in Gallup because there are a lot of Navajo folks who are running for county offices uh, and not just, you know, the Navajo Nation um, elections that are coming up. And so I find that really fascinating that not only are Indigenous folks running, you know, at the tribal, for their tribal governments, but they're really also running for these like county and city seats. And I think that's really exciting because it really changes the dynamics, especially in border towns. Uh, and so I'm really excited to watch that. You know, one of the things that I don't know that many people appreciate about politics, but I've seen it out on the road, is that it's not just about the candidates or even the policies, but it's also about kids. And when kids see candidates running for office, it changes their perception about what's possible. It really does. It really does change their perception of what is possible. And I remember being a young indigenous person, you know, watching folks run for tribal elections and, you know, seeing what really is possible. And, you know, it, it really does change the picture for our young people who, when they are represented within, pol within politics, you know, it gets them excited. They do want to make a change. They want to help their communities. And I think seeing more indigenous folks in these key positions will inspire a whole other generation of young people to run for office. And I think that's very exciting. We'll leave it there. Polly Deniclaw, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark. Rebecca Lansbury Baker is part of the Sundance Institute Documentary Film Program, Ford Foundation Just Films grantee, and a 2022 NBC Original Voices Fellow. She is an enrolled citizen of the Muscogee Nation and the executive director of the Native American Journalists Association, a nonprofit organization that advocates for accurate coverage and representation of indigenous people in media. She is joining us now to talk about her new documentary. Welcome, Becca. Thanks so much, Mark. I'm happy to be here. How did this all start? <laughs> so we actually started filming in early 2019, but the star the stories actually started, you know, way before then. So we have my tribe, the Muscogee Creek Nation, you know, had free press as one of a handful of tribes in um, 2018 that had free press protection. So out of the, you know, 574 
federally recognized tribes here in the US, we have this handful of tribes that have uh, free press protections at the legislative level. And the Muscogee Creek Nation uh, was one of them. So they had this you know, hard fought uh, battle for uh, free press in 2015. And then in 2018, there was an emergency session called by the National Council uh, at the time and free press was revoked in a matter of about 12 hours. So um, that's really where our story started in um, November of 2018, this happened. And so we started uh, we picked up filming in 2019, but um, luckily, you know, I knew that this was such an important story. I had served on the editorial board at the time um, that we had free press for the Muscogee Creek Nation, and I was like, just ask myself, what can I do to, you know, spread this story far and wide? Like, this is an injustice to the Muscogee people. It's an injustice to Indian country you know, how can I garner enough attention to fix this, you know, injustice and uh, restore this. So, uh, you know, I, I started talking with uh, some of my friends. I moved to LA about five and a half years ago. And my husband, Garrett Baker, is a, also a producer on our film, but he was talking with some of his friends who are experienced uh, documentarians and they got wind of the story and wanted to jump on board. So I think that was like the first essential element of like, you know, getting this uh, support for telling this story. Cause I often find, you know, in, in Indian country, you know, sometimes we get, what's the word I'm looking for? It, we know this story so well, like we're so, uh, you know, free press and the challenges that come with that and being, uh, you know, working in tribal media, it's almost just like second nature for us even to, to overlook them um, and working with uh, Naja at the Native American Journalists Association. This is obviously a challenge that, you know, we are addressing daily and, and trying to provide resources uh, towards. So, um, you know, when I'm telling other people outside of Indian country about this story, they're just blown away by the fact that there can be um, a situation where you can have, you know, tribal media that doesn't have, you know, free press. So I think every time I like share this with folks outside of our communities, they're just really shocked. And um, so it made me think like, we need to have this in, you know, a visual storytelling, you know, format. It's, it's important and it can like happen in print, but I want to tell this story and showcase really the diversity that we have within Muscogee Creek Nation and within, you know, Indian country and, you know, see what happens and see if there's anything that I can do along the way of documenting this, just how it has happened and, you know, share that with Indian country, you know, as a, as a template for, you know, restoring free press if it's been taken or, you know, if there are tribes out there that are interested in, you know, getting free press and starting the process and doing that in legislative form, you know, this can be a roadmap for that. But I thought, you know, this just lends itself so well to visual storytelling. And that's one of the things, you know, that I want to do and be able to facilitate is kind of now working in both of these worlds as, you know, representing journalists at Naja and working with journalists and then also being a new first time filmmaker, you know, how can we kind of like mesh these stories because there are so or mesh these methods of storytelling because there are so many important stories, you know, happening in Indian country that I think lend themselves so well to uh, the documentary format. We only have about a minute left, but I, I do want to ask, um, do you think the audience is the citizens who can say to politicians, we just can't do this anymore? Or is it a broader uh, communication idea? I think it's both for sure. So I want, you know, again, the citizens, this to be their story and it gives them a platform that they may not have had yet on the big screen. And so I'm really excited for that. But also, yes, I think anytime we can remind the politicians, um, those who are working, you know, at the tribal uh, level of who they're accountable to, and that's to the citizens. And we provide, you know, another mechanism for that, whether it's free press itself or the documentary, then I think that, you know, we're, we're contributing to that accountability and to, you know, ultimately strengthening sovereignty. Becca Lansbury Baker, thank you so much. Thanks so much.
ICT has partnered with nine news organizations to bring you a new special report. At the Crossroads Stories shares about the state of the economy in Indian country. Today we learn about a place that is special to the Paiute people. It is known on the map as Sacker Pass in Northern Nevada. The location is home to the largest known lithium deposit in the United States and one of the largest in the world. This means it is under threat of being destroyed by mining. Joining us today is Chris Adlin, a reporter for ICT and Underscore News, and he took a deep dive into this story. Welcome, Chris. Hi, Mark. I'll start us off with kind of the main points of the story. Uh, so um, what we have here is it's, it's on the, the, the northern kind of Nevada-Oregon border, and uh, it's a... Uh, um, Ithacker Pass is, has been sacred to, you know, many, many tri or is sacred to many tribal nations. And um, uh, people have known, I guess, mining companies have known about, uh, you know, lithium, lithium deposits there for, for many years. And um, we're kind of seeing now amid, um, you know, a push from the federal government and others to, um, you know, accelerate um, how quickly we are turning away from fossil fuels, as well as sourcing some of those needed minerals um, here in the United States. Um, we're seeing this kind of becoming one of those, the first examples of, of pushback, um, uh, you know, to a mine, uh, you know, lithium, uh, which is needed for uh, electric car batteries. There's, I mean, so many um, layers to this story, but one of the ones I think is just really critical is these competing values. On, on one hand, we can't get to where we need to go without changing fossil fuel um, consumption. And yet things like lithium are critical and copper are critical to getting there. How, how do we have a conversation about this with tribal communities? Um, you know, that's... Uh... I, that's something that the, the federal government is is, is faced with, uh, you know, with as well. Um, you know, the Biden administration said we want to source more of these materials in the U.S. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, even with uh, Secretary Holland, um, you know, the government saying they want to, um, you know, respect the sovereignty and rights and and um, self determination of tribal nations. Uh, so, you know, at least for the company. Um, they're hoping that their promises of economic development, um, you know, jobs for tribal citizens, you know, for the, at least the nearest uh, uh, tribal community job training is, is enough to at least convince those in, in those communities that this is, is a good thing. But, um, you know, they're interesting thing about the story is um, we are going to see more and more of this. Um, these precious metal mines, lithium, cobalt, nickel, um, and, and most of them, like a vast majority, are going to be near or on tribal lands. I think, you know, when it comes to lithium, 79% uh, of reserves in the U.S. are within 30 or 35 miles of a, a reservation. Um, cobalt, it's, it's, I think nearly 100%. Um, so I don't, I don't, uh, I, I think that's a discussion over the competing values that some environmentalists are, are trying to get to the forefront, but, uh, right now it, it's, it's kind of something that hasn't quite shown through, um, in kind of the, the renewable and renewable energy, green energy debate. So I think it will be something that we'll be having more and more frequently as, as the years go on. If you look at history, one of the clues is that the relationships that work between mining companies and tribal governments is to have a real relationship based on trust and respect. Is that the case here or is it a case of, we're gonna mine this lithium no matter what? Um, the, the, the company at question wants to, to have that relationship um, and uh, you know, they've tried and uh, initially they did have have kind of a, a cooperation, a memorandum of understanding with the um, Fort McDermott uh, Paiute. Um, but that was actually the, the tribal council about a year ago rescinded that kind of amid pushback from tribal members um, who, uh, you know, were upset for a number of reasons. But the main reason being that they felt like this was kind of done in secret and um, 
that this, this lithium miner is going to be very destructive to Thacker Pass, which is, is very important for a number of reasons. Um, so they've rescinded that, but the, the company and tribal leaders have continued to have kind of discussions over what uh, um, kind of a cooperation agreement would, would look like and, and what would need to be included um, in that. Um, so in this case, they're trying, but uh, you know, at the same time, there are a handful of other tribes in, in the, the Northern Oregon, or excuse me, Southern Oregon, Northern Nevada area that still are opposed to this because of the impacts it's gonna have, um, you know, destruction of, of cultural sites, um, you know, important medicinal plants, um, potential wildlife, um, actual habitat impacts, et cetera. As you say, Chris, this is gonna be a long conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. And that's a slice of our indigenous world today. We'll be back with another edition tomorrow. I'm Mark Trahan. Times you got to take a stand Just because you know you can Oh, you got to run, you got to run